Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Indiana Landmarks and Indiana Automotive's program on James Allison. We are exceptionally excited to see you here in person and on the screen at home here tonight. Um, Indiana Automotive is uh, founded in 2014 by Indiana Landmarks members and has been dedicated since then to preserving and promoting the incredible places and people that have made Indiana such a great, have such a great automotive heritage. Um, at least once a year, we like to get together and talk a little bit about what we've done, what will be coming up in the next year and recognize some of our best contributors. So a couple of things I wanna mention is as, as you, um, oh, you know what? I gotta hold, I gotta move this thing. There we go. This is what we do. I just said that, but if you didn't like the way I said it, you can read it yourself. <laughs> So, um, okay, a couple things we've done this year, as you know, this is an additional add-on to your existing Indiana Landmarks membership. And one of the things Indiana Automotive does is year round is work to find opportunities where we can help support significant projects that will make a difference in a community that is automotive related. Uh, thanks in part to your support, we added $1,600 to Saving Our Stories, which is a preservation group in Marion, Indiana, uh, and, and an Indiana Landmarks affiliate. And we uh, supported their efforts to explore the reuse of a 1936 Firestone store that was located in downtown Marion. Interestingly, the Marion store, Firestone store, was a week-long celebration amongst the city and included a grand opening event with Harvey Firestone himself. So he was hanging around town for a few days. And uh, since then, a lot of the town sort of kind of built up around this great investment and uh, it fell into a significant state of disrepair. So the funds went towards the study as to how it could be reused and allocated and become a, a contributing member to the community once again. Oh, wrong way. I knew it. Uh-uh. Oh, I got it. All right. Also, uh, through there's the Indiana Automotive Group made a $1,500 contribution to the Indy Racing Memorial Association in support of a historic marker at the 1958 Whiteland Raceway that we dedicated this summer. If you're not familiar, uh, Sarah Fisher, former IndyCar team owner, driver, incredible personality, and her husband, Andy O'Gara, uh, bought the track and saved it. It's one of the longest uh, continuously running go-kart tracks in the country. It's had a couple little spots here and there, but it's certainly a big part of the community and seen some big names put their uh, talents to the, to the track. And so it's become a great community asset again, and they are just doing a great job with it. So uh, we are honored to recognize, help them recognize the significance of that particular piece of Indiana land. In April, uh, we started back with our talking track. It's kind of a gear up to May, which had a great talk with uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway president and CEO, Doug Bowles, and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway's Museum's uh, vice president of curatorial and education, Jason Van Sickle, who did a great job of talking about you know, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as a place for automotive engineering and evolution and the race that, it, that it's become and uh, become as the known the world over and its continuing place in the evolution of automotive technologies. You know, they tested some of the autonomous cars and there's going with the hybrid engine. So working to continue to do what it was meant to do, which was talk about Indiana's role in advancing technology and innovation. Speaking of technology, innovation, uh, our group was able to finally return to our summer tours and with an incredible weekend in South Bend that was originally planned uh, for 2020. Um, and this was a great opportunity where we were hosted at the uh, Studebaker Museum and able to go through the factory and see how they are doing an incredible job of repurposing some of the historic factory and office space into a mixed use development, which again, going back to uh, its role in being a, a, a community asset. And so we were thrilled to have a sold out uh, tour. And we also had a couple uh, private tours there of private collections. So your membership and your attendance is uh, uh, valued and valuable. Oh yeah, there are more slides there. It was a lot of fun. If you see yourself in here and want your picture, let us know. 
Also, if you were here this summer, uh, the Indiana Automotive Group curated the Indiana Automotive Passenger Car Exhibit at the Indiana State Fair. We worked with museums and private owners to select 11 different vehicles to represent Indiana's automotive history and heritage, innovation, style, all of those things, and put our best foot forward to represent what all these great communities contributed to the uh, uh, to the automotive landscape. And almost a million people were able to tour the fair during that time, and, and we certainly owe a great a debt of gratitude to uh, the Kokomo Automotive Museum, Studebaker, Auburn Cord, Duesenberg, Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, and a number of private owners that helped us put cars, some of which were worth close to a million dollars, uh, on display uh, in front of this great group of people, which are obviously dedicated to the state of Indiana. So great opportunity to be there. It was just uh, truly a treasure. So we talked about about the 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 commitment of the community and the support that we get. And Indiana Automotive is led by a volunteer board who serves as an advisory group to Indiana Landmarks, taking a, a wealth of experience, knowledge, and passion in this particular category and advising the experts in preservation that Indiana Landmarks is to find places like the Firestone. Uh, shop that has a much greater history than you might be aware of here in Indianapolis. And so being able to extend our support to, to do that across the state. We have two retiring board members of our volunteer board uh, this year. One, Phil Schaefer, who's been with us a very long time and commutes back and forth from Florida has decided February meetings are difficult. And I don't blame him. He's got a great car to drive in, makes the trip back and forth. But uh, this is uh, these volunteer board members. Uh, do, it is a commitment. And he's had many years of service and we definitely appreciate his support. The other one is George Maley, who, uh, if you're a race fan, you may know from the Jones and Maley specials of the 50s. Uh, he is one of the founding members of Indiana Automotive, and he was retiring this year. And uh, thanks to our uh, fellow board member and automotive artist, Gary Dausch, here in the second row, he has created a custom certificate that we'll present to George here uh, as soon as we can get to him in person. He unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. So I certainly want to thank uh, Phil and George for their service. So we will be adding one new member this year, and we're very excited to uh, introduce Bob Palma. Bob, you wanna raise your hand there, please, for us, thank you. Bob is an automotive writer, editor, and enthusiast who uh, pens a quarterly column for Hemmings Classic Car Magazine and has been the technical advisor for the Studebaker Drivers Club International Monthly Magazine for nearly 40 years. A uh, lifetime member of the Antique Automobile Club of America and Studebaker Drivers Club. And uh, I think he was telling me some stories of a few people and a few times that uh, you'll have to ask him to expand upon uh, away from the microphone. Uh, but we are thrilled to have his passion, wealth, and knowledge, uh, as we said, and, and have his uh, contribute to the group. So thank you, Bob, and look forward to working with you. Now, for 2022-2023, uh, and I promise we're going to get to the program shortly. This is about as fast as I can talk. Uh, we have a slate of officers that we will have contributing to the 2022 and 2023 planning. Uh, first, oh, you know what? Which one of you didn't tell me to move the slide again? Seriously, you all can see what's up there, right? So, all right. Blue shirt guy. You now have to, yes, you have to tell me when I'm speaking and you're now, because you're in my sight line. That's your job now to signal me to move this. There's George and Phil. <laughs> There's Bob. <laughs> Jessica, I told you. <laughs> okay, here is our current slate of members. They're going to be part of our volunteer leaders with the board of directors. Sue Kennedy is chair. Uh, if you were at the South Bend trip, uh, you know, she for years has been the driving force and put together these driving tours. And uh, she did the Auburn one before the pandemic, the French Lick. She lines up the private tours, the museums, the restaurants, the different meetings, the different places. Sue here is incredible, uh, known as the blonde bombshell in high school. Uh, she is really looking forward to leading this group, uh, is a lot, bought her first classic collectible car in 19, uh, 41 years ago, I believe. Still has it. Uh, she and her husband, Larry, are just, it's gonna be great. Jason Van Sickle will be the vice chair. As I mentioned, he was at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. 
Jeff Congdon and Thomas Kreider Reed have been rounding out our uh, team there. So it'd be a great group. Um, so with that, as our new chair, I'd like to invite Sue to come up and say a few words. My name is Sue Kennedy, and I will uh, chair Indiana Automotive next year. Um, I have some pretty big shoes to fill. Dave Wilson has gone the extra mile in serving as chairman of Indiana Automotive. Because of the pandemic, he has served double duty as chairman four years from 2019 to 2022. Indiana Automotive's annual events schedule includes a spring program, a automotive tour in the summer, and a fall program. Dave Wilson's leadership for the last four years has produced some fantastic programming and achieved the mission of Indiana Automotive. In terms of tours, in 2019, we did the Auburn tour. And in June of 2021, we didn't do a tour, but we created an Indiana Automotive Show and Tell, an event for members to bring favorite cars to Indiana landmarks. We planned the South Bend tour in 2020, but it was not uh, to be because of the pandemic. So it was replanned and successfully completed this year. We also developed the annual award for the Automotive Heritage Program. The first annual award for the Automotive Her Heritage Preservation went to the Friends of the Studebaker Fountain in South Bend. Our spring programs always revolve around our favorite topic, which is racing. In April of 2019, Donald Davidson and Sarah Fisher talked about the track. In April of 2021, we learned about the Indiana Racing Memorial Association. The Indiana Racing Memorial Association, also known as IRMA, is a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to recognize historically significant individuals, events, locations, and racetracks that have made Indiana the racing capital of the world. And as you heard earlier in April of 2022, Jason Van Sickle, who serves on the Indiana Automotive Board of Directors and Indianapolis Motor Speedway President Doug Bowles gave our spring program. The fall programs in November of 2019 had Andy Beckman here of the Studebaker Museum talking about the history and the decline of the Studebaker. In November of 2020, we had a virtual annual meeting about the diamond chain history. And last year, November of 2021, we heard about Cummins Engines and its contributions to Indiana's automotive history. In addition to this programming, Indiana Automotive gives grants from Indiana's automotive funds. In May 2020, the Auburn Corps Duesenberg Museum received $2,500 to assist in the cost of, of architectural and engineering services relating to roof repair and roof replacement of their building. The Indiana National Road Association was given $2,000 to improve its online driving guide. And in January of 2022, we received a request by a local nonprofit saving our stories for $1,600 to help pay for two studies to see if restoration of the Firestone Tire Store in downtown Marion, Indiana is economically feasible. In addition, Indiana Automotive paid a portion of the cost for two Irma markers. The Newport Hill Climb uh, had an Irma marker placed there downtown at the courthouse in October of 2021, and the Whiteland Raceway, owned by Sarah Fisher and her husband, received an Irma marker in July of 2022. The Indiana State Fair, featuring the history of the Indiana automobile, was the real feather in Dave Wilson's cap. Dave Wilson played a significant role in the success of this Indiana automotive exhibit at the State Fair. 
He located the cars for this exhibit. He arranged for transportation of those cars. He prompted the owners and the museums who were loaning the cars to provide text and old photographs of the cars. And shortly before the exhibit was to open, the story graphics were insufficient. Dave and Indiana Landmark staff, Jessica and Evan, made them right. Dave spent a great deal of time making this Indiana State Fair ex exhibition what it was. He is to be congratulated for his accuracy of the content of this exhibit. When you tell the story of automotive history in Indiana, accuracy is really important. Indiana Automotive, an affinity group of Indiana landmarks. We celebrate the early auto visionaries and their products and promote the preservation of the cars, the factories and showrooms, the homes of auto mo moguls, and the landscape parkways and roadside architecture birthed by the auto age. This is our mission statement. Congratulations to Dave Wilson for a job well done in guiding us to achieve the goals and missions of Indiana Automotive during the last four years. Indiana Automotive recognition of service of Dave Wilson in recognition of outstanding service and leadership as chair of Indiana Automotive 2018 to 2022. Congratulations. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Well, well. I got to say, I saw the run of show and was part of the planning of the remarks, and those weren't in it. Thank you very, very much. It's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and a joy to talk about uh, what a topic uh, uh, to live with and to talk about as a hobby and to work with to educate and make so many people aware of what the tremendous work that's been done in the automotive industry. So uh, thanks, Sue. I really appreciate the kind words and thanks to all of the support for those of you who, sh who continuously showed up through the pandemic to support our work. And obviously, we're trying to leave it out on the road and in the streets and in the community. So thank you. Ha, slide. I bet that was for me. Ha, ha. That's not on you. That's on her. <laughs> All right. Well, how about the real reason uh, we are here tonight? Very excited. Uh, we've talked about a little bit about the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We've talked a little bit about uh, the effects of a company or a place on a community. We've talked and and uh, we've talked a little bit about engineering and innovation. And there's been one person in our history that really represents all of those things, and that's James Allison. Uh, from his work pioneering automotive headlights at Presto Light to founding the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and Allison Engineering Company. Uh, prolific entrepreneur James A. Allison left a lasting impact on Indiana's automotive and engineering heritage. I think the thing to remember with all of this is that it's people that makes this happen, makes these places and things. And James was certainly one of the exceptional ones that we've had. And tonight we're absolutely thrilled to have two special guests that can talk a little bit about uh, those varied interests and passions that Allison brought to the community and uh, the area of uh, automotive and engineering development. John Leonard tonight serves as the archivist at the Rolls-Royce Heritage Trust, Allison Branch, born in Greencastle, conveniently grew up in Speedway, graduated from Purdue in with a degree in mechanical engineering, and spent most of his career in St. Louis for McDonnell Douglas, where he worked on the F4, F15, F18, and several other advanced design projects. Retired back to Greencastle, uh, and then, like many uh, great folks, went back to work dialing a little bit with Rolls-Royce in the controls department on several engines, and then got involved with the Allison branch of the Rolls-Royce Heritage Trust, where, among other things, he's written four books on Allison engines. Deb Lawrence serves as a senior vice president for strategic partnerships and general counsel at Marion University, where she develops and executes strategic plans for neighborhood and economic development activities and other community partnerships. 
In 2003, she helped to oversee a cultural landscape report that identified the work of landscape architect Jens Jensen at Riverdale, James Allison's historic estate on the Marion University campus. Since that time, Deb coordinated a 2005 symposium on historic landscapes in Indiana and managed the restoration of Riverdale's gardens, winner of a 2019 Indiana Landmarks Outstanding Restoration Award. Deb is a longtime member of Indiana Landmarks Historic Landscape Committee and uh, where she helps build awareness for our state's historic hidden treasures. So we've got a little bit of everything for you from the landmarks architecture to automotive uh, engines and engineering. So it's gonna be a great show. And so to start us off, I'd like to invite John Leonard to the podium who I believe was informed on how to work the, the trigger of this thing better than I was, so thank you. Thank you, Courtney, where's the button? Right there and down, the down button there. Yes, so I first wanna say to cover Jim Allison's life in 30 minutes, so I'm gonna obviously leave a few things out. Uh, Jim Allison was a partner in the Prestolite Company, founded in 1904. He was a co-founder of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1909. He was the founder of the Speedway Team Company in 1915, and he was involved in the development of Miami Beach, also in 1915. So this is where his life fits in with other uh, notable aviation pioneers, uh, pretty much at the same time. He got into business because of his father's interest in the Allison Coupon Company. The picture on the right is a picture of Jim Allison's father, Noah Allison. And uh, he also ha I also have the picture of his return address on uh, one of the, some of his mail. But the interesting thing that he invented was this coupon company, this coupon book. Back in those days, if uh, people went to a store, a lot of times they didn't have the money to purchase the items they wanted, so they'd have to ask for credit. A lot of times they never got around to paying it back. So Jim Allison's dad came up with this coupon book, and when you opened it up, there were little tabs that you could tear off. And once you tore one off, they were worthless. So the uh, person that you sold the coupon book to you would um, tear it off and then um, so this book, for example, was a five-dollar book. He would sell it to their cust they would sell it to their customers for four seventy-five. So then they got a, a a discount for using the coupon book. Noah Allison then sold them for five and a quarter, and he made a little money. And the advantage for the proprietor was that he got the money at the at the beginning instead of waiting until after he delivered the product. So. When his father died, uh, Jim Allison, his brother, took over the business. And uh, after a while, uh, Jim Allison retired from that and went on to other things. Okay, so, oh, so th this is a picture of the uh, Allison Coupon Company building in Indianapolis. I took that in 19, uh, in 2015, and it's uh, still there. Then Jim got Allison got into the Perfection Fountain Pen Company. We have very little information on that, but we found this one advertisement where he was advertising his product. Uh, he was the fountain pen manufacturer, and uh, he had a little company that would make these and repair them. And uh, he founded that in 1894, and he sold it in 1898. Then he got into the Prestolite business. The problem that people were having in the early 1900s with their automobiles is they couldn't drive at night. And the automobile headlights that they had were little kerosene lamps, and that didn't help very much. Well, it turned out if you had a acetylene flame, they put out a lot of light. And so they came up with this Presto light uh, tank that had uh, was a acetylene tank. The upper picture there is a um, picture of a acetylene tank mounted on a coal automobile. And down below, you see a picture of the tank itself, and it's got Prestolite uh, impressed on the tank. So the way this worked was that 
uh, if I lived in Greencastle and my uh, acetylene tank was empty, I could go down to the inner urban station in the evening and I could put it on the inner urban and it would bring it into Indianapolis. And at the Speedway plant, they would refill it with acetylene, put it back on the inner urban. The next morning, I could go down to the station in Greencastle and pick up my acetylene tank ready to go again. Well, this was a great idea and they made a lot of money doing it. Uh, it was founded by Jim Allison and Carl Fisher and uh, PC Avery in uh, 1904. Uh, Avery got out in 1906 and then uh, the company was sold to Union Carbide in 1917 for nine million dollars. That was nine million dollars back in that time period, so it would have been a lot of money today. But they not, were not only into headlights, but they were also into these products, most of which we know very little about. They had the Presto starter, the Presto tire tubes, Presto tire tanks, Presto carbon remover, and Presto welder. I don't have much detail on those. Um, but pressed, uh, acetylene was a very touchy material to deal with, and they had a lot of explosions. So in 1907, they had this explosion downtown. Um, in 1908, they had three explosions downtown, and the city of um, Indianapolis said, you got to get out of town. So they bought some land, uh, farmland out in what's now Speedway, and they built a plant where they uh, did their brush to light stuff. These are some of the branch offices that it had. You, we tend to think of Prestolite as being just a speedway operation, but he had uh, branches all over the place. There's 24 listed there of cities in the, in the United States and uh, eight more in other countries. And so it was a, a, massive, a massive business and they made lots of money doing this. Uh, here's an advertisement we found for the Presto tire tube. And this uh, cylinder, if you had a flat tire, a uh, tire needed some air, you could hook this up to it and uh, charge up a tire. You could also take this in and get it refilled and uh, uh, use it again. So by 1964, uh, this is a picture of the Presto Light plant in Speedway. And you can see there a picture on the right or a, a notation there on the right where Main Street and Speedway was and the 16th Street where you're kind of coming across the bottom of the picture. Then uh, Jim Allison and Carl Fisher got into uh, the Empire automobile business. Um, that was in uh, 1909 and they sold that business in 1911, but uh, it went out of business in 1919. Probably in those time periods, there were a lot of little companies making cars and uh, pretty soon there was more cars than anybody needed. So here's the uh, founders of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Arthur Newby, Frank Wheeler, Carl Fisher, and Jim Allison. And um, these guys put up the money that uh, financed the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Here's what the track looked like in 1909. It was a two and a half mile oval. It also had a uh, airfield in the middle and there were a couple of, there was a hangar in there for airplanes. And there was a field where you could uh, refill your hydrogen filled balloons. So they were gonna have some balloon races a couple of grandstands, and um, this is what things looked like in the early years. Uh, the 10th Street, or excuse me, 16th Street would have been vertically along the right-hand side of the picture. Here's what the uh, first uh, race looked like. They had several um, races the first day, but mostly they were short, uh, short races. The longest one was a 250 mile race. That would have been 100 laps, the half of what they are now. But at the speed of 54 miles an hour, that was a five hour race. So a lot longer than they are today. They also had a, a national balloon race the first year. And there's, I think there's nine balloons in this picture. And so they would uh, fill these things up with hydrogen and let them go and see who could go the farthest. In 1910, they had an air races. Uh, the Wright brothers showed up for that, and they also set an altitude record of uh, 43,384 4, feet. And here's a picture of the uh, Wright brothers' airplane uh, at the uh, at the track. This picture shows the uh, aerodrome that they had inside the track. 
It was large enough to have 20 airplanes inside plus a dirigible, and, but it was destroyed by fire in 1914. You also see uh, one of the bridges that went over uh, the track and over the stream that ran through the racetrack. Here's the uh, start of the first uh, Indy 500. In the first race in, in 1909, they had several accidents that killed several drivers. And so they went back and um, repaved the track with bricks. The, the first track was uh, rocks and tar. And um, by 1911, why it was the brickyard. And you'll notice that each of these race cars have a number on the uh, radiator, one through four. And the car on the far right, was the pace car. And the thing that's interesting about this is you wonder how the guys in the second row could even see where they're going because they put out so much smoke. Because Jim Allison was uh, owner of the track, he wanted to have his own uh, race cars. And so in 1916, he had uh, two or three cars in the race. Um, the one that's shown on below is the premier that he used in 1916. The driver was Tom Rooney. It started in seventh place and ended in 17th place. There was no race in 1917 or 18 because of World War I, uh, races were canceled. But in the 1919, uh, Jim had a Pigo, a race car, and the driver was Howdy Wilcox. He started second and ended first. So Jim was now satisfied that he'd won a race on his own track with his own car, and he got out of the racing business. Jim Allison was a member of the Robert Park Methodist Church. And in 1915, he, they were um, renovating the church and he bought them a brand new pipe organ. This is a picture of the uh, mansion that he built in, in Indianapolis. And um, Dave Lawrence will give you a lot of details on that, details on that in a few minutes. Um, Allison and Fisher were also involved in the Severin Hotel in downtown Indianapolis uh, starting in 1917. It was a grand hotel. It had a marble staircase and it was near Union Station. And there were about 300 trains a day. Train transportation was a big deal but back then, not, not the aircraft like it is today. And uh, Allison and Fisher were investors. It went into decline over the years, but it was renovated and reopened in 1990. Once the racetrack was built, the uh, need for repair of automobiles was uh, apparent. And they'd have to take their cars downtown to Indianapolis to get worked in on them. And uh, Jim Allison thought, we need a machine shop out near the racetrack where we can uh, work on race cars. So he built this plant in, in uh, 1917 uh, on Main Street in Speedway. Um, this is a picture taken inside that uh, early plant. Um, if you look close, you can see a frame uh, for, for a race car in front and then the, the body and uh, back farther, you can see a race car with uh, number 16 on it. And so this is the inside of his first plant and uh, shows some of the work that they were doing there. At the same time, they built the second building, the one on the left. Um, this picture was taken in 1928, but the building was still built in 1917. And uh, Jim Allison had his office on the second floor over on the corner. So here's a floor plan for the second floor. His office was in the lower right-hand corner. He had a fireplace in his office. He also had a little uh, restroom of his own, including a shower. And over in the opposite corner, he had an automobile elevator. So when he would drive to work, he would uh, pull into his plant on the, pull on the elevator in the lower floor, go up to the upper, upper floor, and uh, he wouldn't have to worry about snow or bad weather. He could just get right into his office. A lot of people uh, that worked for Jim Allison in those early days didn't have their own automobile. And so he came up with the Allison Service Company and uh, would uh, go around in the morning and pick up his employees and uh, drop them off and then take them home in the evening. In this picture, you see pictures of two of the Rios that he used for uh, transporting people. And you can't see the uh, 1919 Ford, but it's kind of hidden behind the people between those two Rios. 
Here's what the inside of the machine shop looked like in the early days when a lot of the machining was done with uh, pulleys and, and the belt drives and, and shafts. And um, this would have been the inside of the plant one building. Sometime later, he uh, was involved in this building that was across the street. We call this the Pomilio building because a couple of Italian aircraft designers were using it for a while. Um, it was originally called the Highway Tractor Building, and then the Pamilio brothers took it over. Then uh, Jim Allison had it for a while, and then eventually sold it to Esther Lyon Angus. There was a drafting room in the Pamilio Building. You'll notice a couple of spittoons on the floor, and um, there's a display case on the right-hand side that shows the um, yacht that he used uh, in the early days. The uh, Lapache La Cruiser was built in 1914. He bought it in 1917 and used it for four years. And it was powered by a couple of 250 horsepower engines. There was a shop in the Familio building that was involved in Liberty, Liberty engine modernization. So you see on the right-hand side, the uh, assembly line where they would take the engines apart, they would replace uh, the uh, parts that were worn out. And uh, on the left-hand side, there's a collection of the engines that they had put together in this building. Jim Allison and Carl Fisher both ordered airplanes from the Pamilio brothers. Uh, they had been brought to Speedway to build airplanes for the military services. And uh, Jim Allison's airplane was gonna be two or three seats. It was supposed to be able to operate from land or from sea. And uh, it was so that he could fly back and forth to Miami Beach a lot quicker than he would if he had to drive it. However, there was no indication they ever built this airplane, but he did order it in 1919. The Pamilio brothers built these two airplanes in Speedway. Um, they only built uh, half a dozen of each of these. One on the left was a um, fighter airplane. The one on the right was a bomber. And even though half a dozen of each were built. They only built one of each in Speedway. And then the rest of them, they built the parts in Speedway. They shipped them all to uh, Wright Field, which was called McCook Field at the time. And they were assembled over there. Uh, there were so few of them that they were actually never used in the war. They were probably more used for training. During the First World War, there was this aviation repair depot in Speedway uh, on the east side of Main Street. And because of the newness of aviation, uh, they crashed a lot of airplanes. So they would put these on uh, trucks or on, air, on uh, trains and they would haul them back to Speedway. There was three or four of these repair stations in the United States. And um, if you look on the lower left corner, you see the a fairly large building. It was the Pamilio building. Just to the right of that, there was a YMCA building. Um, there was a, a barracks and a mess hall on the left-hand side. And then there was a engine repair building and an a, uh, airframe repair building all in this complex. So they'd bring these airplanes in as a wreck and they'd repair them. Then they would haul them over to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway where they could take off on the airfield that was over there. And this is what the engine overhaul building looked like from uh, Main Street. It was a wooden structure. It was, it was a little bit on the old side by the time Jim Allison got a hold of it. This is what it looked like on the inside. And you can see the workbenches and uh, toolboxes. Uh, there's an engine on the right-hand side. And um, this was kind of the way things were done in the early days. So next, I want to show you some of the early projects that uh, were worked on. And the ones I'm going to show you are the only ones that were worked on when Jim Allison was alive. So he worked on the, the Caterpillar tractors during uh, World War I. He worked on gearboxes for the Shenandoah airship, the, um, the Bavazat helicopter, and uh, some, uh, some uh, aircraft gearboxes. So this uh, tractor, this art, art, artillery tractor, was built by the Holt Company. They eventually became the Caterpillar Company that's in Peoria, Illinois. And the military, instead of hauling these artillery pieces around 
wanted to have a self-propelled artillery piece. So they contracted with Allison to mount one of their cannons on top of this um, artillery tractor. And Allison did that work. And uh, in the lower picture there on the right, you can see they had braces on the back so that when they fired the gun, it wouldn't uh, tip over the, cat the uh, Caterpillar tractor. They also um, put this thing together. This would have been a typical uh, military truck. Uh, Holt built the Caterpillar tractor part that's on the rear end instead of the wheels. And um, as a test run, they drove it from Indianapolis to Peoria, Illinois. You see this sitting in front of plant, plant one on the muddy main street that was in Speedway at the time. Here's the uh, Shenandoah airship built in 1922. It was a hydrogen filled um, airship. And you'll notice the uh, little gondolas that are hanging underneath it. They didn't want their engines too close to all that hydrogen. So they mounted them on these little gondolas. And you can imagine how difficult this would have been to fly because each one of those gondolas had a mechanic in it that controlled the engine. So the guy up in the front that thinks he's flying it is actually talking to somebody in each of these little gondolas saying, give me more power, less power, left or right. And uh, it would have been a difficult thing to fly. Down below, I've got a pictures of the gearboxes that Allison had built for it. Also, the first helicopter that the Army built was uh, designed and built by a Russian aviator named Debathazat. And this is a picture of it. And Allison built the gears, and there was gears all over the place um, for this helicopter. And <laughs> the thing actually did fly. Here's a picture of it in the air. It turned out it, it couldn't go anywhere, but it, it could take off very clean and land. So then Allison got into uh, engines. Uh, they worked on the Liberty engines. The Miami 12 was an engine for Jim Allison's yacht and for some other yachts. Uh, the Miami light was a little uh, generator set that uh, provided electricity. And the X-45 was a big uh, air-cooled engine that uh, they worked on. I'll show you some pictures of those. Liberty engines uh, were primarily uh, upright, pistons pointing up, and they were water-cooled. They built uh, 20,000 of those, but Allison only built a couple of them. Um, but they also had inverted water-cooled engines. They had inverted air-cooled engines and upright air-cooled engines. And Allison built a few of those, but none of those were built in large quantities. And then we got into gearboxes. Um, as it turns out, as uh, aviation developed, propellers wanted to turn slower, but the engines wanted to turn faster in order to generate the power. So in order to make that work, you had to have a gearbox between the two. And these are some of the gearboxes that Allison designed for Liberty engines. They also built this gearbox for Liberty engines. This was a, a device for combining the power of four Liberty engines uh, for one propeller. And uh, the picture at the bottom shows a, kind of a side view. Uh, the lower Liberty engines were kind of back off to the right-hand side of the picture. And then the upper engines were closer in and on the upper side. And um, the, the upper picture on the left shows the big gear that was in that, and they were powered by each of these four engines. When they put this thing to test, the uh, gearbox was uh, very reliable. They didn't have any trouble with it, but they wore out 12 Liberty engines just trying to get through the test. This is the airplane that it was intended for. Um, it had a crew of seven. It had the four Liberty engines, but uh, it was never built. Then Jim Allison got into uh, mo motors for his uh, yacht. This is a picture of the uh, Miami 12. Um, he wanted a better engine that was available in the marketplace. And so he went to his chief designer and said, I want you to design for me a good engine. And so this is the one that they built. And the picture on the right shows a uh, engine room on one of the boats that used this Allison engine. There was actually two versions of this engine. He had a version for his cruiser, and then he had another version for his uh, speedboats. He was uh, into racing somewhat. And in order to do that, they ran at a higher speed. They, the, the basic engine would put out about uh, 450 horsepower, but 
his racing engine put out over 500 horsepower. And he got that by uh, increasing his speed and upping the compression ratio. So here's the boats that those uh, engines went into. The one on the left, uh, lower left, is his uh, seahorse. It was his cruiser, and it, it was uh, fast for a cruiser. Uh, and uh, he did in some cruiser races. And the upper one is the uh, II Sur, which uh, was a speedboat. This is the Allison Light. This was a little generator set that he wanted to have on their cruisers uh, that provide electricity for lights and radios and things like that. Uh, it, it was a four cylinder engine, produced five horsepower. My lawnmower at home, my riding lawnmower, has got one cylinder and I got 15 horsepower. So back in those days, they didn't produce that much power. Jim Allison was into uh, uh, fish. He had quite an interest in that. And he built this aquarium in Miami Beach. It opened in 1921, um, but he sold it in 1923. It wasn't particularly a successful venture, but uh, President-elect Harding visited in 1921, and, and it was quite a um, muse museum for uh, as an aquarium. Uh, he had his uh, cruisers, and he would go out in spring and, and uh, capture uh, fish out of the ocean, and then he'd bring them back and uh, put them in his uh, aquarium. He also had a mansion in um, Miami Beach. Um, when Carl Fisher designed uh, Miami Beach, a lot of the islands that he built, he just dredged them up out of the ground. And uh, they were sort of this oval shape. And uh, Jim Allison had uh, one of the lots with a mansion on it there on the lower right. Uh, Jim Allison was not a particularly healthy individual. Uh, he spent some time in hospitals and he was not happy with the treatment that he got in these hospitals. Um, so he built his own hospital and he was able to get the kind of service that he wanted. And it, it really uh, didn't work out very well because all the services that he provided were very expensive. He had to be very rich in order to uh, provide, uh, provide the money that was needed. So uh, it opened in 26 and he got rid of it in 27. And then he died in 28. This is the uh, X4520 that was developed while he was there last couple of years um, before he died. He wasn't particularly interested in the work at Allison in Indianapolis. He was more interested in the work that was going on in Miami Beach. But uh, this engine was developed. It was air-cooled. It was um, a 24-cylinder uh, engine, uh, produced 1,300 horsepower. Uh, when they finally were able to test it, uh, they discovered it didn't cool very well which is very typical of uh, air-cooled engines in that vintage. And uh, they broke a piston, and so then it became a museum piece. After uh, some period of time, we were able to get it back and restore it for uh, our museum. And uh, that's kind of what it looks like today. So Jim Allison was not very healthy, as I would mentioned. He had his heart, first heart attack in 1914 when he was 42 years of age. He had the bronco bronchial pneumonia in 1921. He had sinus surgery in 1923, another heart attack in 23. Uh, records indicate he was in poor health in 26. He was using a wheelchair in 27, and he died in 28. So he didn't take too, too good a care of himself. But he left a lot of legacy. The uh, Prestolite plant that um, he, he helped start was now part of Praxair. Indianapolis Motor Speedway is still open, and uh, it's a it's a great racetrack. There's a street and a school in Speedway named for Allison. Allison Mansion is still is now part of uh, Marion College. Allison Transmission is a very successful company. Uh, they have uh, plants in a couple other countries of the world. Uh, Allison Gas Turbines is part of Rolls Royce, and there is an Allison Island in Miami Beach. That's the end of my presentation. You want to use the second button from the bottom. Okay. All right. Will do. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. That was interesting. And as you can tell, uh, Jim Allison liked the rich life. So we're going to see where he lived because it was uh, an incredibly special place. Hopefully a lot of you have been able to actually come to Allison Mansion for an event. Um, we have a lot of wedding receptions, parties. Most people know Marion University because of Allison Mansion if you're not connected to the college. So hopefully um, if you haven't been there, you'll come. I wanted to give a little timeline. Uh, John did a good job. Just how early these entrepreneurs were doing the automotive work. You know, we think of Ford, obviously. They were right in there um, doing all kinds of interesting things uh, that built the legacy that frankly funded the house that you're gonna see. So um, just a timeline. Um, neither Fisher nor uh, Allison lived long lives. So the amount they accomplished in their short lives is pretty extraordinary. Um, I don't think either one of them took very good care of each other, of themselves. So we've seen James, there he is. Um, we are, the Marion's campus is on what used to be called Millionaire's Row. I don't know who named it, but we had the Wheeler, Fisher, and Allison Estates. Um, we speculate that they wanted to be close to each other as business partners, close to downtown and far enough from Speedway so that if the plant blew up, it didn't harm their houses. I don't know if that's true, but that's what we believe. So, um, so it's on Cold Spring Road. Hopefully a lot of you know it's near Riverside Park um, and it kind of is halfway between downtown and Speedway. Allison Mansion was um, a passion project for I think Mrs. Allison and for James. Uh, there's all kinds of engineering in the house, not surprising. Automatic lights, there was an elevator. I mean, any innovation in 1911 that he could either invent or find uh, was there. But what most people don't know is it there was nothing there. It, I mean, it wasn't a beautiful bucolic anything. It was blank farmland and he built it literally from the ground up. Had people we believe living on site the whole time. It took about three years to build. Um, and it was one of the grandest places um, in Indianapolis at the time, and we think still is. I always like this picture because it shows his mailbox on the corner of the of Cold Spring Road. <clears throat> so there's more construction. The rumor was that he built a barn around the house. If any of you have seen the house, it's huge, so that's no small barn, so that no one could see what he was doing. I don't know if that's true, but it's a good story. And you can see again how barren that area was compared to what we think of it as today. And there's the finished house with kind of nothing around it. Um, and a picture of the interior um, there. So again, he loved the rich life. It's very Victorian. So it's layers on layers on layers of fabrics and curtains. And um, the chandelier that you can see there is a two ton, literally two ton German chandelier. And if you go up into the attic, there's a huge superstructure that holds it up. And I hope it continues to hold it up, but um, so far so good. Um, but very lavish, very, um, again, European. We believe Mrs. Allison went to the Biltmore Estate in uh, North Carolina and borrowed some of the ideas from that massive place to bring back to Indianapolis. We have uh, huge fireplaces in almost every room. Um, they were all gas because people were afraid of fire, um, which was pretty modern at the time. Carvings, hand carved everywhere. We don't know who the artisans were, unfortunately, um, but we think actually that they may have gone from Allison's estate to the Ford estate in Dearborn because there's some similarities. So there was an automotive connection that we've not really been able to identify, but there's a lot of similarities between some of the big mansions, um, including Allison. But everywhere you look in the mansion, it's hand carved. There's faces everywhere, um, which I'm sure was intentional. Again, there's a second story view of that massive chandelier. This is Mrs. Allison's sitting room. 
So she obviously loved sort of the French look, which at the time was very popular. Um, and so that was her sitting room. We use that as an office these days. We do have some of the original furniture, um, which we have in the mansion. And then this is his library. He was a book collector and some of his books are at the Lilly Library at Bloomington. Um, and so it's a small space with some uh, beautiful uh, hand-carved walls and a rookwood fireplace. And there's that rookwood fireplace. It has all kinds of heraldic, I think fake heraldic, but um, heraldic symbols. Apparently, Allison Fisher and Wheeler fancied themselves as the Three Musketeers. And so there's symbols all over the place that don't make a lot of sense to us, but clearly had some meaning to him. This is the aviary. Most of you, if you've been there, you'll remember this. This is the marble room. Um, and it was a very traditional, again, kind of Victorian-ish um, place where Mrs. Allison kept tropical birds and ferns. And it was, a, it was a conservatory, for lack of a better word. And the carvings are all indicated of that kind of use. So we have hand-carved marble um, birds throughout that area. And that's what it would have looked like at the time. Um, there was a pool in the middle. We think it had fish in it. Um, we can't really tell from the picture. And then it's, we believe it's a Tiffany ceiling. And uh, the Tiffany ceiling is there. In fact, it's in the midst of being restored. The pool is not there anymore. This is uh, the music room. So uh, among the other things that Mr. Allison did was apparently he was a pretty good organist. And so you can see uh, against the wall, the far wall, is an organ loft. Um, those pipes got moved to the chapel when Marion College took it over, um, but apparently that was something that he liked to do in his spare time. And again, all the carvings are related to the use of the room, and so we've got lots of hand-carved instruments in the music room. This is what we call the overlook room, which is a porch, another area that Mrs. Allison would have used. Um, it's our biggest room. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have any of that wicker. I wish we did. This is the dining room. The dining room, uh, again, lots of heavy carvings. The house was made for entertaining, but there were only three people that lived there permanently. Mr. Allison, Mrs. Allison, and Mrs. Allison's daughter. So it was typically set up for a much smaller family, um, except when it was being used for entertaining. And these are the, this is the fireplace in the dining room. And again, with all the hand carving. Now, this is the card room downstairs. What we understand is the Fisher Wheeler and uh, Allison were gamblers and rum runners. And so <laughs> apparently this was the site of a lot of action. But behind those doors that you can see is a refrigerator and a gun closet. I don't think that's a good combination, but apparently somebody did. So. And the walls are hand painted and it has three figures dressed like musketeers. So that's where we think the three musketeer piece came from. This is uh, Allison's bedroom, which um, is now the president's office, um, a huge room. And then this is his bathroom, which has a surround shower and a bunch of things I don't know what they're for, but it's probably bigger than most of our bedrooms. Um, so again, no expense spared. We have been told, I have no documentation, that the house cost $2 million in 1911. I mean, that was real money. So anything he wanted, he got. This is actually a sleeping porch. Some of you may be familiar with that. The floor is cork. And so because the mansion didn't have air conditioning at the time, that's how they kept cool in the summer, was having sort of it's like Goldilocks in the three bears beds, but, um, and then opening all the windows. So this transitions into the landscape and John mentioned, um, you know, that this is part of a bigger um, landscape project with Jens Jensen that we um, discovered now in, since 2003. Um, Jensen was also connected to automotive barons we don't know how, we don't know why. He started out in Chicago. So we suspect that some of the Chicago moguls hired him and then he got down here to Allison, but we don't know how he got to him. 
Um, we're grateful that he did. But this shows you what's looking east towards the mansion from the landscape. And again, that's when Marion College took it over in 1937. As John said, Allison died in 28. It sat empty um, for quite a while. And in the middle of the depression, nobody wanted a mansion except a college. So we were lucky enough to, to get it. One of the benefits was that people actually got to go in, right? Because it was a private home. So um, the newspaper article is sort of, hey, you can see this amazing house. The natural lands landscape, it looks like it was just there. There was nothing there. This is all created by Jens Jensen. I always like to include this because you can see, hopefully you can see there's a number of young nuns in habit in the landscape. Um, we now call this the Ecolab, and we do a lot of K-12 outreach, but it was part of the designed landscape that Jensen created. He created a series of lakes, again, out of nothing, um, so that it was a pleasure garden, basically. There's the three estates that I mentioned before on Millionaire's Row. Each one was very, very different. Unfortunately, the Fisher Estate no longer exists. Um, there were a number of fires. The Wheeler Estate is still there, and um, some of its features are still there, and obviously the Allison Estate. This is what um, we started with in 2000, was just some trails that we didn't really know where they were, why they were there. We found this design rolled up in the maintenance uh, shed, which was the first indication we knew it was a designed landscape. Um, and that is Jens, Jensen's original design for that. You can see that, you know, there were a huge swaths of uh, ponds and trails, the house, and then all the support things that you would expect in terms of gardens, greenhouses, all the things that kept the estate going. Th there's a bridge under there. That's how uh, far gone things were down in the landscape when we started. Um, and we found it really by accident. This is about Jens Jensen. Some of you may know him from the Chicago Park System. Um, again, he worked for Henry Ford. He was a pioneer of natural landscaping, things that we take for granted now, native plants, water, um, color, movement, um, a real pioneer um, ag against the more formal strategies that were prevalent at the time. Um, and so we have all of these features in our landscape. We're very fortunate to have that. That's what he started with, blank canvas. Uh, that's on the hill. The house is about where the farmhouse is on the left. That's Cold Spring Road and looking towards Riverside Park, for those of you who are familiar. And that's again where the house is. And these are the structures that he built. He built a ton of um, field stone structures that were decorative. Um, he built them with horses and people wearing ties, which I always think is interesting. And I mentioned that uh, Allison's engineering came out. He created a, a, a waterworks where he could decide how rapid the pool was going to be. So if he wanted smooth, he could change it. If he wanted it to be sort of white watery, he could change it. They didn't mess with small trees. And then this is, you can start to see some of this coming together in that lower area where there wasn't anything. Hand designs, beautiful designs. That's building a huge bridge that uh, goes, uh, we have three of them. And that's what it looked like originally and what it looks like now, still there. And then this is where you start to see what it looked like. And it was actually a driving landscape. Um, we think that's an electric car. Um, and so the trails were big enough that he could drive around. We did have cows. And then this, this is really the fruition of all that work. And you can see the mansion just next to the colonnade. And none of that was there. 
None of that was there. They brought every piece of landscape in to create that landscape. So again, $2 million. This starts to lead up to the colonnade, um, which is a significant Jensen feature. You can see this is at the colonnade looking back out into the landscape. Um, Jensen was a big believer of getting people into nature and having spaces to gather. And so this was one of ours. This is a little bit closer up of the greenhouses and some of the other things, as well as the formal garden, which is what we focused on in our restoration. That is the design for the part of the formal garden, which I find interesting that it is so precise. And then there's the colonnade, which again is right up against the landscape and creates a gathering space. That was the focus of our restoration project, which was completed a couple of years ago. And that's the design we created. We literally took every stone down to the ground, labeled it and put them back and did a beautiful, really amazing restoration. And there they are going back up. St. Francis was not part of the original design, I just have to say, but he's been there for 60 years, so he's not going anywhere. This is the pond that you could see in the original that we restored. This is starting to get back in all the plants that we put in. And this is what it looks like today. It's grown out, it's beautiful. And I really encourage you to come, it's open to the public. We're in the middle of a restoration of the mansion, so it's a construction site. It's a little dicey, but the garden is spectacular, um, and we encourage people to come. That's an aerial view of what the colonnade ultimately looks like, and the fountain was restored. Um, we're really proud to be the holders of Allison's legacy. Um, we've invested a lot of resource in both the mansion and the landscape to make sure that um, he would be proud and that the city can be proud. We do limited tours, um, but again, the campus is open and we'd really welcome you to come and see it in nice weather. Thank you. We've got time. For some questions, uh, Deb uh, and John, if I can have you come up, I'll have you share the mic. Is the handheld mic live? And I can go Phil Donahue if you want to raise your hands and I'll run to you and to ask. And we'll let them sort of alternate questions as way it goes. But thank you both so much. I, I wanted to say one thing. I'm stunned by the fact that I haven't been to too many presentations where both presenters have used the words explosion during the event and so casually yeah we would rather avoid the explosion uh and clearly i've underperformed uh in my years because that both of those legacies are just in incredible so um i know we had a uh a question that came online already was where was the noah allison family home and where did jim live before riverdale and then uh, Deb, you answered the other question already, which was how was uh, how did Jensen get connected with these folks? You sort of ended the presentation. So where was the Noah Allison family home and where did Jim live before creating Riverdale? And then if somebody wants to raise their hand, I'll run to you while they're answering in the back. So I think originally uh, Noah Allison lived in Michigan. I think uh, that's where Jim was born. Uh, we have the addresses of a couple of houses in Indianapolis where he lived before he built Riverdale. Um, I haven't actually gone to a map to try to figure out where they were, but I rather suspect they were pretty nice homes. Uh, from your present, uh, from your presentation, I gathered the Allisons had no children, but she had a daughter. And what happened to Mrs. Allison and the daughter? Um, I don't know where she landed, but she was from Mrs. Allison's first marriage. And so she was part of their family after they got married. I don't know if you know what happened to Cleo there now. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Um, and that was obviously not his child. He didn't have any children. Oh, all the way over there. I'm going over there. Please. 
I didn't hear the whole answer. What happened to Mrs. Allison after Jim died? Well, uh, he had divorced her by that time. He had married his secretary. Um, and, he and he died a couple of weeks later. Uh, there was an estate, there was an estate battle between Mrs. Allison, second Mrs. Allison and mom, and mom won. And so she inherited the estate. And I don't know after that what happened to Sarah. Did he die of natural causes or from the secretary? Uh, no comment. <laughs> I, I think Jim Allison was a sick man. He just died of natural causes. <laughs> uh, this is a question for Deb. Um, the uh, kind of bathhouse building near Riverdale, near where the uh, kind of locked locks are, are there any plans to renovate or or restore that structure. Can you tell me more about what that was for? Yeah, so that was actually part of the neighboring estate that was built to look like it was part of the Allison estate. So the Summers Mansion, which is north of Allison, they had a huge um, uh, entertainment area, bathhouse, pool. And so that's all part of that other estate. I don't know that we'll have the energy to raise the money to do that, but there are some beautiful structures still back there. It's part of Cold Spring School, which was an IPS school, still is. Um, we own the property now, but it's attached to the Summers Mansion, not the Allison. Uh, how did Marion University end up acquiring all three estates? Um, it was over time. Uh, the middle estate, the Fisher Estate, many of you would know as Park School for boys. Um, the Summers Mansion that I mentioned was Tudor Hall, and they merged. Um, the third one was the Wheeler Estate, and eventually the owner sold it to the sisters of St. Francis because we needed more space. So it just over, I think, about a 20-year period, we ended up acquiring all three estates. I don't recall ever seeing any kind of carriage house or garages associated with Riverdale. Are there any? Yeah, the so directly south which is now the Norman Center, was the garage for Allison. Um, I think it was six days or so, um, but it's been repurposed for years, so you might not recognize it as a garage. And then the Wheeler Estate had a huge structure and a water tower for like eight cars. So all of them had huge garages, as you would expect. The uh, Wheeler Estate one, I think, fell apart in the 60s. So, But you can still see remnants of the Allison garage. So, Deb, when uh, Jim sold the property to the sisters, was he magnanimous? Did he drive a hard bargain? Was it was actually the bank. It was in the, because he had died and his mom had finally passed away. So, it was sitting in the depression and the bank didn't want it. So, they got a pretty good deal, I think. Was there a mortgage? I'm sure there was. I don't know what it was. Uh, was there a uh, swimming pool in the basement of the Allison Mansion at one time? There was, and there still is. Yeah, we've covered it with a floor, but it's still there. Yep. I saw one hand go up right here. Thank you. I'm curious about Jim Allison's upbringing. He quit school at a young age to work in the coupon business. I don't know what he did there, but did he have any formal education? If you read what Jim Allison says about his education, he said he didn't learn much that he could ever use. I think after his, um, after he dropped out of school, I think he did, I mean, obviously he was quite a reader, so he uh, could have picked up a lot of things, but he was never uh, very, much uh, enamored with the education that he got. Could you uh, speak a little bit about how General Motors got involved with Allison? When General, when um, Jim Allison died in 1928, um, uh, Eddie Rickenbacker got involved in, uh, he, he had been a race car driver and he got involved in it and uh, they wanted to sell it and they, when they put it up for sale, 
one of the stipulations was that they had to keep the operation in the op they had to keep the the work of Allison in Speedway for 10 years or something like that. And um, none of the companies that wanted to buy Allison wanted that stipulation. Um, they wanted to get the uh, patents that Allison had, particularly on the uh, steel backed bronze bearing, uh, the assets of the company, and then they would disband the company and take uh, anything useful to another site. But because they insisted on uh, retaining a uh, presence in Indianapolis, uh, General Motors at the time was interested in aircraft. Uh, they had uh, owned, I think, part of, of an airlines and, and part of North American aviation for a while. And so they looked at Allison as a um, place that they could do certain aviation activities for the whole corporation. At one time, uh, there was a division of Cadillac that was doing aircraft engines, and they took that work and brought it down to Indianapolis and, and uh, brought it together. So General Motors uh, turned out to be a good fit for Allison. They were happy to uh, leave the plant there and uh, continue to develop things. Um, the V1710 engine, which came a little later than Jim Allison, but it was a, a big engine in World War II, was uh, developed under General Motors money and uh, became a, a we were about 70,000 of them during the Second World War. So uh, General Motors was, uh, I mean, they were doing diesel engines and all kinds of stuff. And so Allison was a, a good fit for General Motors. Great. Anyone else have anything they want to ask for the group? I think you're willing to, John, Deb, willing to hang around for just a little bit if there's some one-on-one -on -one questions that don't want to be out loud. One more. Thank you. All right. I suppose the original uh heating system for Allison Mansion was probably uh, steam or, or hot water. And it, I think it was an, a separate building for that power plant when there's something. What, what are you using now for heating and cooling? Well, thankfully, we have modern air conditioning after a lot of years. Yeah, the garage also had the heating and cooling in it um, across the parking lot, What our parking lot. So where the garage is just to the south was where all those units were because, again, they were very afraid of fire. They were very afraid of things blowing up. And so they moved them away from the house. That's three reference to exploding and blowing up. <laughs> well, John and Deb, thank you so, so much for this history and, uh, uh, and for keeping the history current. As we talk about history in places, there's a continuum. And I think I encourage you, if you haven't been to the mansion, please make a trip out there. And uh, the Her Rolls Royce Heritage Trust, Allison Branch, you know, where there's a lot of places, these are places that you can continue to visit and see and experience. And that's what Indiana Landmarks is all about. And Indiana Automotive is proud to be a part of that. So on behalf of the board of directors, but on behalf of Marsh Davis, president and CEO of Indiana Landmarks, we greatly appreciate all your support. We've got a lot of things coming in 2023 that Sue's going to lead you to a great, great year. And so thank you so much for being here and enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care.